spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Well, aloha, and thank you so much for joining us here on this Wednesday. I'm Yenji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei This is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we have two guests. Later on in the show, we'll be joined by Mufi Hanneman, who will be live from the convention center at what is one of the first large-scale events at that venue since COVID uh, hit our islands two years ago. But first, Ryan, we are heading to Kauai. That's why we want to bring in uh, Mayor Derek Kawakami joining us from Kauai. Good morning, Mayor. Great to see you again. Oh, good morning. Great to see you. Uh, you know, we've had many conversations over the past few years, uh, particularly around COVID-19 and your island's response. Uh, of course, we know just a few weeks now that the, the uh, emergency order that the governor had uh, has expired and that masks are no longer uh, mandatory. What are you seeing uh, on your island with regards to the mask mandate being lifted and how has the community responded so far? Well, our community always responds well, and um, but it's pretty trippy because there's a lot of people that um, are sort of using their COVID common sense to to respond with their own personal behavior. Case in point, um, I just went to Ishihara Market the other day to get lunch. And um, that was on our break when we were handing out free home test kits. And um, so I walked in um, without a mask, didn't quite get in and looked in the store and saw everybody wearing a mask. So I said, oh, well, you know, this is just like um, anything else we do in life, if you go to somebody's house and you see people doing a certain thing, you don't want to be the oddball. So I just went to my truck, got a mask, put it on and went in. And I think that's what we're going to generally see. We're going to see a mixed bag of people who are really relieved to lose a mask. And, um, and you're going to see at times that people will put a mask on as, as a sign of respect. Um, we just went to the movies and um, and not many people were wearing masks, but everybody was eating popcorn and having a great time. So I think it's good. Yeah, there is this sort of delicate dance that's happening. I find myself doing it too. I get on an elevator. It's like, what are we? Are we? What are we doing here? Are we wearing one? Are we not wearing one? Um, but there is this continued debate about what should happen in schools. Of course, that's the one place Hawaii public schools, uh, other than healthcare institutions, where masks are still required, at least for the time being. What are your thoughts on when uh, restrictions should be lifted on kids? Well, you know, we have a different perspective here on Kauai because very early on um, we had allowed youth sports to take place with with spectators um, and that was even before vaccines became available so um, we've always felt based on the science that children um, don't get impacted as severely um, I think the DOE works closer with the Department of Health um, when coming to those decisions so I would hesitate to give an opinion that's not based on the science that they've been talking about. But I think generally speaking, based on our vaccination rate um, and the high number of teachers that have become vaccinated, that um, I, I think it could happen. But like I said, I'll, I'll leave it up to the experts. I know that um, if I had a younger child um, and based on what I hear from from some parents who the child has struggled to wear a mask. Um, I would want to have my child attend school um, probably without a mask on sooner rather than later. And um, I think it's seasonal. You know, I think um, like everything else, if we keep an eye on things and you see cases starting to rise, then maybe in a school setting, um, they would have to go back. But I'll leave it up to the DOE and Department of Health to make that call. And moving forward, are you or do you foresee any um, restrictions continue to be in place or rules, I should say, rather, um, about those who are vaccinated or unvaccinated? You know, the Governor Ige 
has stated on this program that in order to be a state employee, you're going to need to be vaccinated. Uh, you know, and we've also heard from others who will probably implement some sort of requirement for hiring of employees uh, on the county level. Do you see any of that happening on your island? No, we did. We did at first as a condition of employment, and that was purely out of necessity. You know, we um, we are a county government. We take care of roads, trash, ocean safety, fire, police, and a number of critical services, and we just don't have a deep bench. So, you know, we were taking a look at the numbers and with our existing employee base um, and with the lack of uh, workers um, that we wouldn't be able to afford having a whole department get sick because that would mean perhaps your trash is going to sit for a week or we wouldn't be able to respond. So early on, we did have a condition of employment that did require vaccination, but that's power already. What do you think about the lifting of safe travels? Your island was one of the most stringent when it came to allowing visitors during the height of the pandemic. Um, were you sad to see that program sunset or do you think that that was the appropriate time? Oh, it was the appropriate time. And, you know, again, our overall strategy on Kauai was to really keep it, keep it tight early on until we could get the vulnerable um, segment of our population fully vaccinated and then hit like the essential workers, get them fully vaccinated. And then um, as you folks may have seen, we started lifting restrictions um, rather quickly. And even through the Delta and Omicron surge, um, we didn't add restrictions. Um, and that is because our strategy early on was to um, set up a real strong border, get people vaccinated, um, and then start to lift restrictions. I think Safe Travels did well, did wonderfully well. Um, but I think it's high time that um, we say uh, farewell to Safe Travels. It served its purpose. And in stick, sticking with that topic of safe travels and those visiting your island, uh, we know that there are many people who came to the island. Of course, uh, when things started to, when, when numbers began dropping and, and we began to see uh, some of the more positive signs of COVID-19 coming to an end, uh, what are you seeing right now in terms of volume over there on Kauai with visitors and how uh, have things been thus far in managing, uh, you know, what locals that have become, uh, has become an you know, somewhat normal for local residents once again to get their beaches back, but now having uh, this influx of tourists. Well, it's a work in progress, Ryan. And, um, you know, fortunately for Kauai, um, we've really sort of been like a pilot project. We were the first county to really effectively enforce on the illegal vacation rental market. Um, we were the first county to get into an agreement with Airbnb um, and Expedia to have them only promote um, vacation rental, rentals that were legally able to operate. And so from a capacity standpoint, um, you know, when we're 100% capacity, it's it's over capacity for Kauai based on our infrastructure. Um, but there are things like uh, KA State Beach that during the floods of 2018, they were able to deploy alternative transportation solutions and parking management, which has really tried to strike the right balance and have the coexisting of our number one industry and economic driver, which is tourism, while also not eroding further the quality of life for the people that live on this island. So we've just basically started to identify um, parking areas on Kauai at county beach parks to do a parking study and start to do some parking management. The other key player in all of this, of course, is Sue Konoho at the Koi Visitors Bureau. And of course, everybody at HTA and HLTA. Um, we're right now working with KVB to start looking at low hanging fruit on the Destination Management Action Plan or DMAP. What would that look like uh, for you? Do you think that we should be promoting it Hawaii in a different way? And specifically for your island, what do you think should be done with tourism management? What could we change that would actually yield some results? Well, I think for us, it's managing our parking facilities. I mean, we just, that's where a, a bulk of our complaints from people like myself even, um, going to the weekends and try and get a parking spot at Poipu Beach 
and you're going to be doing laps. And so from the county's perspective, um, one, policies in place, effectively managing the illegal vacation rental market. To me, if counties don't get a grasp on that first, it makes it hard because you have no way to really set a capacity for your island. Um, two, taking a look at our infrastructure and where we can create better traffic flow. In the Poipu area, uh, we're deploying a number of roundabouts in that area, which from a safety perspective is great because it slows cars down. From a traffic perspective, it keeps the traffic flowing. And so it's the low-hanging fruit that your local county government can get deployed, working with the state um, as partners, working with community groups such as what the state and counties did with the Hanalei Initiative out in the North Shore. And then from the visitor industry, the more education they can give to their guests because they are the, that point of contact and the most frequent point of contact for our visitors is to really educate them to stay on the beaten path that, you know, as, as out of respect to this place, um, here's the things that you should and shouldn't do. And um, I know that Iceland does a fantastic job as far as visitor education and keeping people on that beaten path and telling them, hey, don't wander. When it comes to some of these things that you're talking about, obviously it's going to come at a price tag. And there are some who are suggesting that there should be some sort of travel tax, something that's added on uh, so that the visitor should be paying, paying for some of these infrastructure upgrades. Do you think like that there that should be some sort of implementation of some sort of added fee or tax, if you will, to visitors only uh, to pay for some of these improvements that need to be made to overall infrastructure? Yeah, of course. I think um, when you take a look at it, there are other areas where visitors like myself have to pay an additional fee. Um, I do know that when the state took away our appropriation of the TAT um, in the same breath, they gave us the ability to impose that 3%. But then also in the same breath, they really didn't allow um, dole tax in the state to, to help us collect it. But Fortunately, all of our finance directors um, with all the different counties really put their heads together to figure out a way to, um, to work around that challenge. And so we're collecting our 3%. And um, we have to remember some of the original intent of that TAT tax was one, to reinvest into infrastructure to help create that coexisting of our environment with both visitors um, and residents alike. So we are putting a much of those TAT dollars to some of those improvements and to the management of the visitor industry. You know, one of the things you talked about was controlling the parking and, oh, sorry, not this one. Uh, Ellie has this question. She says, Mayor, can you work out a same, the same deal you did with Airbnb and Expedia for Turo? Uh, for viewers who aren't familiar, Turo is a car ride sharing pro or car sharing program, uh, much like Airbnb, where you can rent an individual's car uh, rather than go through a rental car company. Uh, I know here on Oahu, there are some communities who say there are way too many cars suddenly in my neighborhood. They're not rental cars, but I know they're not residents who actually live here. What are your thoughts on Turo and that program and what that is doing? Look, technology is a double-edged sword, right? I mean, it's a tool like a hammer. A hammer can be used to build things, um, but it can also be used to demolish things. And, you know, with Turo and with the third-party platforms such as Airbnb, it can be a tremendous tool when it comes to consumer choice options. And of course, you know, competition usually lowers prices for consumers as well. But in this case, there needs to be policies and parameters set in place. And oftentimes local municipalities like the counties find ourselves stuck between a rock and a hard place because the speed that technology evolves um, and the innovation that's involved in it um, happens so quickly that our ability to have parameters in place before the technology gets deployed is virtually impossible. So that leaves um, things like the counties and states um, scrambling to figure out a way to, to manage these sort of new technologies coming on board. Um, in the case of Turo, I know a lot of their issues um, is in dealing with parking. Um, 
in particular with Kauai, um, one, they're going to have to go work with the airports division under DOT, which is part of the um, state of Hawaii. So they wouldn't be dealing with us. Now, they've reached out to us to see if we would be willing to open up parking at our county facilities. And off the top of my head, we'll think about it. We can talk about it. But I would say it's not likely to happen because we just don't have enough parking um, to go around for recreational use and day-to-day -day use. And um, we're definitely not in the business to commercialize our parking lots. I want to also talk about some of the things that we've seen over the past few years. In fact, uh, what's happening on the North shore uh, of your Island with, uh, you know, any new storm that comes in or storm front, we've often seen that community being shut off because of multiple landslides and access to the area being cut off because of, uh, you know, roads being literally washed away. Uh, can you tell us on the status on how things are looking up there for the North Shore community and moving forward because of the frequency of the amount of these landslides that we've been seeing and access being shut off? What do you believe is a long-term solution for this? Oh, man. You know, the long-term solution is we got to come together and realize that um, our existence um has a profound impact on the environment and people can debate on whether it's real or not but um i've seen enough of the science and we're living through it right as a surfer i think uh, more in tune with changes to um to our environment that you know more than the average bear so when we start to take a look at green infrastructure projects or when we start to take a look at diverting more of our solid waste, um, it all boils down to the impacts of climate change and rising sea levels. And um, all across the world, you're starting to see uh, more frequent wildfires on the mainland over and over again. You're seeing an increased severity and frequency of tropical storms and hurricanes, which we're no stranger to. You know, we just had the U.S. Army down yesterday taking a look at some assets on the North Shore um, in partnership with our Koi Emergency Management Agency um, just to make sure that when the next storm hits um, that we have assets and resources in place and we're continually trying to build resiliency within our communities. I mean, we just had a rock slide in Waimea um, that cut that community off and you know, when you take a look at the environment of West Kauai and North Kauai, it's two two big differences. One one is very dry, and one is very moist. And um, but yet they have similar challenges when it comes to 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 these big storms. So the long term solution is we're all going to have to change our behavior and our way of life and leave less of a footprint on this earth. Um, but short term solutions is to build resiliency within our community. You know, North Kauai is no stranger to having to deal with extreme weather events. So that is a community that is well prepped to be able to lean on each other and have us come in to support them, which, you know, they've coined the term community led and government supported. And we're going to have to take a look at building that resiliency in every single community across the state of Hawaii and right here at home on Kauai as well. You know, whenever you come on, we see these comments, things like, we need him as Hawaii governor. Heidi's yeah. saying, yes, Miguel, wish he was running for governor. We know that you're not running for governor, at least this time yeah. around. You've made your intention clear. But I do want to engage you with a little political hypothesis here, and that is there is speculation that Congressman Kaitahele could vacate his seat to run for lieutenant governor. That would open up a, a statewide office there, his seat. There is some speculation that you might be interested in running mm. for Congress. What do you think of that? Is that something that you would consider? Well, I mean, my first question is, what's the surf report like in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> no, it's not something I'm looking at. Look, my heart is here. It's at home. You know, I was in the State House of Representatives and, um, you know, my family is here. That's my foundation. You know, my kids, my wife, um, you know, my friends who are family. And um, that that's really what I'm all about. Just, you know, I'm a coy boy that got lucky. You know, I never even thought that I was ever going to be mayor. None of my friends ever did. Gosh, if my mom and dad were here, they'd probably attest to saying we never thought this kid would ever be mayor. And so I just think I'm blessed to be here right now. 
And even more so, even more than that, I, I'm grateful that I found something that I love to do, right? Like every single day, no matter how big the challenge is, I wake up stoked that I get to like be a part of this community and like be positioned to just help. You know, I'm such a, I mean, I, I love being out in the field with the roads crew, patching potholes, being at the landfill, driving equipment, going down to DMV and surprising people and registering their vehicles. I'm very much a hands-on type of person. And for a person like me, I mean, there's so many types of jobs to do here at the county. And then there's the day-to-day -day in the office. I, I love this gig. Uh, why would I leave a good, a good deal when I got one? So look, it, it's, um, I don't know what the future holds, but I do know one thing, whatever it is, my wife and kids are going to have to be 100% behind it for, for me to be successful and for me to want to be doing anything. So we haven't gotten to that, to that bridge yet. Well, before we let you go, uh, we know, of course, you gave your state of the city, uh, county address, I should say, and, and laid out sort of the, the map for the next four years as you head into the second term. Uh, your final thoughts as you lead this county for the next four years, some of the things that you will be focusing on and, and you want the residents of Kauai to know this morning. Yeah, we're back to basics, right? I mean, we're just trying to rebuild a strong foundation. You know, that's the often overlooked the most important component of any structure and even as a person right like early childhood building a good foundation in people so we're getting back to basics i mean the state of the county may have sounded fancy but if you dig deep into it we're focused on building our people up creating opportunities for jobs through reinvesting in infrastructure 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 and building housing and um, we're just gonna continue to do as much as we possibly can to lead this island um, into the 21st century and to make sure we give our kids an environment and a place to call home that they can thrive in. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Derek Kami, Mayor of the County of Kauai, for being with us this morning. We always love hearing from you. Thank you, folks. Thank Aloha. you. And we're now heading over to the Hawaii Convention Center where Mufi Hanneman, president of the Hawaii Tourism and Lodging Association is joining us live uh, from the Hawaii Hotel and Restaurant Show. We've got a lot to unpack about what the mayor uh, of Hawaii said. We're gonna do that later. First, uh, Mufi, we wanna get to you. This is a very exciting event and full disclosure for our viewers, uh, Star Events, which is uh, an arm of the Star Advertiser is involved with putting this show on. But tell us about the show and, uh, and what you're seeing there this morning. Well, first, I want to do a shout out to Mayor Kawakami uh, for helping our industry on Kauai open up safely and effectively. He's done a wonderful job. Uh, yes, this is the show. In the words of Ed Sullivan, we have a really big show, really big show. We've been wanting this to happen for quite some time. We debuted this in 2019. We've been on hiatus. And now it's an opportunity to have the best of the best in services, technology, food, equipment, Take, you name it, we have it here. And there's exhibitors from all over the world, over 200 exhibitors. We expect four to 5,000 people to come through. Wonderful partnership with the Star Advertiser and the Hawaii Restaurant Association and the Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association. All happening right here at the convention center. Lots of smiling faces. Everybody's saying, finally, we are open. Yes, we are open. And Rufi, if you can go into briefly about how the, this type of event, um, you know, moves the needle for tourism as a whole. Uh, obviously, we are still rebounding in a sense where we are continuing to see uh, pe people return to the islands. Uh, but as we continue this dialogue of finding balance with the community uh, and tourism and events like this that really help provide opportunities for local individuals and, and those people who maybe... Uh, had their services kind of put on hold for some time because they relied on the hospitality industry. Um, how significant is that? This is very significant because this is the biggest local gathering uh, that we've had in quite some time. And it's happening at the convention center. And that's a key component in having our hospitality industry come back to be able to have large meetings at convention centers, at hotels, and other large ballrooms throughout the state of Hawaii. So this is huge in that regard. It also reinforces the image that we want to that our hospitality industry uh, is no kawaii. That we're always looking for best practices. We're always looking for best materials, technology that others may do and bring it here to Hawaii and do it in a way that makes sense for our people. So this is very huge because it's an opportunity also to show to all the businesses, whether in restaurant, 
retail, attractions, hotels, what have you, uh, that uh, we're going to be opening up and we're going to have opportunities for people to grow the economy and bring people back to work. You know, we know that you obviously are at the forefront of helping to revive the tourism industry. We saw, you know, a lot of people coming last summer and then, of course, spring break. But those marquee events like what you're talking about right now at the convention center, we haven't seen those large gatherings. When do you anticipate that getting up and running? And obviously, as you said, an event like this does signal that it is safe and that is something that is actually possible. Well, you know, we couldn't have picked a better time. We didn't know that safe travels was going to be lifted on March 26th, when we picked this date uh, back uh, late 2021 because we kept postponing it. So the timing is excellent. As I said, this signals the first large gathering and we're hopeful that the momentum created from today and tomorrow will lead to other uh, convention type meetings to occur here uh, in the state of Hawaii. Uh, that, and of course, the other missing component is international travel. And uh, we're making progress with the country of Japan. Uh, we hope to see that happen uh, sooner rather than later, maybe taking advantage of Golden Week, which is in May, as the Japanese government continues to relax its restrictions. So we still have a long way to go, as Robert Frost says. I have miles and miles to go before I sleep. But certainly it's a good uh, awakening, if you will. We've come out of our slumber, and we're ready to rock and roll and go forward and bring people back safely, efficiently, and effectively. All right, before we let you go, for those who may be watching and are interested in attending, can you give us uh, any information that people need to know uh, about heading down to the convention center? Yeah, this show is for a hospitality industry professional. So if you do business with hotels, with restaurants, with food services, you want to come here, you go on the website at Hawaii Restaurant Show, Hawaii Hotel Restaurant Show .com to register uh, and you're welcome here. And then we have great auction items uh, we're giving away trip to New Zealand. A chance to see Tua Tagovailoa and the Miami Dolphins play or to see the Los Angeles Rams play. Those are auction items that we're giving out uh, for people to bid uh, to help our organization and our foundation. Okay, Mufi Hanneman, president of Hawaii Tourism and Lodging Association, live from the Hawaii Hotel and Restaurant Show. Thank you for bringing the update and all that enthusiasm this morning. We appreciate it. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Well, great to hear from Mufi there. And as he said, we are looking forward to welcoming international visitors back. That's something that we talk about with the governor and with others in the tourism uh, tourism industry. Uh, and that show that Mufi's at right now is very significant. And uh, that's why we wanted to bring him on live. Going back to our previous guest, Ryan, uh, Mayor Kawakami, saying, how's the surf report in Washington? A clear indication that he's happy where he is. Yeah, and we've heard this many times uh, and we've asked him questions about different <laughs> political offices almost every time that he's on the show because well, there seems just to be an affinity for him and his style and we see it in the comments and we often just hear it overall and so we have to ask him. But he's reinforced that he is committed to the island of Kauai and, and as he laid out uh, at the end there of our interview with him saying we're getting kind of back to the basics and really focusing on infrastructure. We heard from him about some of the challenges that continue to be presented on the island of Kauai uh, with relation to, of course, managing tourism and trying to find new opportunities and new ways uh, to have uh, the infrastructure support uh, the areas where, you know, we find this common ground between our common locations between tourists and locals. And so they are looking at uh, improving different areas on the island that cater to both visitors as well as locals, uh, as well as the overall infrastructure of Kauai uh, as they move forward. Yeah, and you did hear a distinction between his decision making and the governor's. The governor saying uh, when it comes to COVID-19, he is going to continue to require state employees to have a proof of vaccination. Uh, the mayor saying that they're pow with that on Kauai, at least for now, and so that that is not a priority for him. He also did say that while he leaves it up to the DOE and the DOH when it comes to students in masks, uh, on a personal level, if he had a child that was uh, on the younger side, he would probably want them to learn without a mask. But he was very deferential to those two agencies, saying that he's not a scientist, but just from a personal perspective, he would like to see those restrictions lifted sooner than later. We're going to be sticking with politics, Ryan, with our guest on Friday. That's right. We are. Um, <laughs> we I have Lieutenant Governor is. Josh Green. That's who he is. is running for governor, <laughs> as we know. So we're going to be talking to him in his role as LG, but also talking to him about the campaign. Um, you know, he's been polling pretty well. Uh, I, you know, he has uh, some others that uh, want to, you know, get a stronger foothold in that race. But given, you know, where he's polling and also the amount of money he raised, he really is the front runner at this point. We've had political analysts on this program say it is his to lose.
So um, how is he campaigning and what are his thoughts if he were to be elected about what the legislature has done this far with the budget? Uh, whoever becomes the governor will have to contend with that. So lots of questions for Lieutenant Governor and candidate for Governor Josh Green. He'll be joining us right here at 1030 on Friday. And that's why we encourage all of you, you know, we have been doing this, having these conversations with other political candidates as well. We heard from uh, former Mayor Kirk Caldwell uh, just a few days ago as well, and uh, also have talked to Vicky Cayetano. And so it'll be interesting to see where they stand based, uh, where the Lieutenant Governor stands and some of the same questions that we asked those running against them. Again, that's happening on Friday. Uh, we hope to see you then. Thanks for joining the conversation today. Uh, we'll see you right back here on Friday. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.